All set, thank you. It, you're muted, Alex. Yep, there you go. Oh yeah, I have to unmute, sorry about that. Uh, welcome everyone to National Distance Learning Week with um, SUNY Online. I'm Alexandra Pickett. I'm the Director of Online Teaching for SUNY Online and I will be your moderator today. Uh, we have a few housekeeping items. Please keep your mics muted as this session is being recorded and we will have time for Q&A at the end, but you can also type your questions in the chat. Um, we'd love for you to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from and a little bit about you. Um, I am thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Andrea Nickisher. Dr. Nickisher is an adult educator with over 20 years of experience providing crisis intervention and violence prevention workshops for schools, businesses, and community groups. Dr. Nickisher is uh, currently the associate professor uh, and interim chair of the Department of Social and Psychological Foundations of Education and Adult Education at SUNY Buffalo State. She has taught 100% uh, online asynchronous uh, courses for over 10 years. And in 2022, she was awarded our SUNY Online Effective Practices Award for Universal Design for Trauma and was named a SUNY Online uh, Teaching Ambassador. So we are super excited to hear from you today, Andrea. I'll pass it right over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I love National Distance Learning Week. So um, it's so fun to uh, be part of this event. And I really appreciate the invitation. Um, and I appreciate all of you joining me live today. And those of you who will be watching the recording later, welcome to you as well. Um, so this is a really fun presentation because um, we get to time travel back to um, 2013 uh, when I first proposed an, a, a theory for online teaching called Naked Teaching Online. And um, what I hope to do today is, is go through those past, um, the past uh, theory and sort of the, the slides I created in 2013, and then show how they relate directly to um, uh, RSI and best practices for RSI in our online courses. Um, so uh, I look forward to time traveling with you and then um, coming all the way to the present day in 2022. So what is naked teaching? That's the first question. Well, for one, it's a really great title that people want to <laughs> come and see your presentation. Um, so I always get a lot of great uh, uh, feedback from the title, but Essentially, naked teaching is something that Jose Bowen proposed um, in a 2012 book, Te Teaching Naked, How Moving Technology Out of Your College Classroom Will Improve Student Learning. In 2013, Bowen came to SUNY Buffalo State to do a lot of workshops with us and help us think through um, his theories around teaching naked or naked teaching. Um, and I was very moved by his passion for student engagement and retention. And I really, as a, as a new online instructor, I was in year uh, two and a half, um, I wanted to uh, have a sense of um, how to translate or really embrace this idea in my online courses. So I began doing some research and creating sort of my own theory um, for naked teaching online. But Jose Bowen really talked about the idea that face-to-face -face courses had to evolve because online teaching was really starting to spread um, and become more common across the US and across the globe. Um, so he really proposes a flipped classroom structure, which re rejects the use of lecture. And of course, we all know um, that uh, lecture is not a best practice in adult education uh, as it's 
traditionally conceived. Um, so his ideas were really in line with my field, which is adult education. Bowen's focus is uh, what I think is most important, and that is on the high quality instructor student interactions. Um, and for him as a face to face teacher, that became the focus of his work within a physical classroom space. Um, for me, I wanted to bring that concept into my online asynchronous space, uh, which can be a challenging space um, to conceive really deep and meaningful one-on-one -on -one and larger group interactions. Um, so for Bowen, he engaged students outside of the classroom using technology and a more flipped approach. Uh, back in 2012, we were talking about Khan Academy, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, certainly we've expanded um, that quite significantly since that time. Um, so here is my 2013 uh, sort of proposal for Naked Teaching Online. I presented this at, the, at ESJ, which is a National Equity and Social Justice Conference. And really, I think that RSI um, is a great move for social justice um, because what I proposed in 2013 pre-RSI, um, and what Bowen is proposing is that to help all students of all backgrounds succeed, we have to have that direct faculty-student interaction and engagement, um, and it has to be deep and meaningful. Um, so in 2013, I proposed uh, my online version of Bowen's Naked Teaching, which privileges instructor, student, and peer-to-peer -peer interaction over tech and tools. Um, Naked Teaching Online was a rejection of the move to massify and automate or semi-automate online courses. So going back to 2013, right, we're seeing MOOCs um, and sort of Bowen's conversation was that MOOCs are going to take over education and every classroom will have 10,000 online students in it. Um, but that has not happened. Um, but at the moment, the conversation was really one where we were trying to envision today, 10 years from then in 20, 2012 and 2013, what would it look like in the online space? And there was a, a, a group of folks who were arguing for a really automated view of online education, um, where students were kind of isolated on their own, working on their own without a lot of um, touch from their instructor. And so my theory at that time was a rejection of that um, and really an argument that an online space can feel very similar to a face-to-face -face space. And in fact, it can be better. Um, it can often be an even richer, more meaningful, higher touch space um, because it's equitable for students um, who may be introverts or who may be, um, for some reason, have um, less opportunity or willingness to participate in a face-to-face -face space. Um, so that's 2013. Um, really the strengths of Bowen's work, I think they hold up. Um, he prioritized faculty student interaction and we're seeing that as the priority coming from the federal government today. Now I will talk about how the federal government came to do a deep dive into my online courses right before they created RSI. Is it a coincidence that they completely match the way I teach? Who knows? <laughs> we may never know, but I'd like to tell myself <laughs> that maybe when they came and uh, had, did that two hour uh, deep dive into my courses, it, it helped um, frame their view of RSI. Um, but Bowen really discouraged the use of lecture. Again, that's a great move forward and promoted the, those interactive learning activities and significant learning uh, experiences. Very similar, I think, to D. Fink. Um, his theories from 2003, and again, adult education best practices, andragogy, um, uh, etc. What was interesting in that 2012 discussion with Bowen was that 
his focus um, really was on saying, listen, everyone, higher ed is changing and we can't pretend it's not. And so it's really important for face-to-face -face faculty to be part of the discussion of those changes. And as an online faculty member, I felt um, that was important for me too, uh, because, um, you know, obviously the world has changed. We'll talk about COVID a little bit later, um, but even in 2012, you could see what was coming. And um, Bowen was really kind of uh, reacting to that and trying to prepare for that. There were, were some, in my opinion, weaknesses. These were the weaknesses I identified in 2013. Um, I, I think that while he wanted to promote faculty-student interaction, his focus was too much on what is done outside the classroom. And at least for me, as a, a faculty member and an instructor and an adult educator, the most important part is that faculty-student time. That's the part that I wish he had focused on more. Um, at the time in 2013, when I critiqued his work, um, you know, he really spoke of students as a, a very uh, sort of one dimensional group of young tech savvy people, which of course is not the world we live in. My students, I always have students in their 60s every semester because I work in a career changer uh, field. And so sort of that one dimensional, everybody's gonna be the same, it didn't work. Um, I do think that we've gotten over some of the barriers from 2012 and 13 in relationship to access to technology, access to the internet. I think we have worked really hard to solve uh, some of those problems and certainly COVID advanced our ability to do so. Um, and another weakness would be, of course, that his approach seemed best for undergraduate courses and less for those really high level uh, graduate um, work. So um, Bowen and online courses in 2013, uh, just to give you a sense, um, you know, I think at that moment, um, you had a face-to-face -face instructor who didn't understand online teaching, um, and that was problematic. I don't think he really understand the richness of the work that we do. And a lot of us who are online instructors have probably had the experience of trying to describe to our face-to-face -face peers what we do and the value of what we do. And that's an ongoing conversation still. I would say, and I'm not sure what everyone else has experienced, but um, that time in, in 2020 where everyone was forced online uh, definitely increased my respect, the respect I received from my peers um, when they realized the importance and value and challenges of the work we do as online instructors. Um, I have never um, really supported the separation of instruction and course design. They have to go together. There has to be a marriage there. Um, you can't um, sort of put them into different camps because they are inextricably linked. Um, I really think, and again, 2012, 2013, thinking MOOCs might take over the world was not an outrageous um, thought, but I think what, um, what we've learned uh, is that MOOCs have a wonderful purpose. I love to participate in you know, photography classes and other classes. I mean, there's so many amazing opportunities. They are a key element of adult education, but in terms of higher education, they can be problematic, particularly for underserved students. Um, so I think that, um, Bowen didn't fully see the future and, and there's a limitation there. But most importantly, this is something I advise everyone all the time. The future is not written. If you think you know, change is coming, sure. I think we can agree to that. But what that change will look like is whatever we make it look like. And I think sometimes we have too uh, much of a fatalistic view of the future. Um, 
and I think that's that can be problematic when we're talking about really creating um, theories for teaching and learning. So for me, naked teaching online at the time um, and really translates well still today, built on Bowen's work to create what I call a flipped online classroom. It focuses on professor, student and student, student interaction in my graduate courses um, and in the building of strong learning communities. Um, technology increases touch. Um, what that means is my students are not off on their own, isolated with a tool that I can't see and can't interact with. Um, the technology is the video tools. Um, one thing I love about Brightspace is how easy it's going to be to put those videos in to have that um, one, on, one way and two way conversation with students. Um, and we have to remember that critical thinking and strong writing skills are still paramount to student success in a globalized world. Um, we have to be able to promote those. So a flipped online classroom for me, and, and it's this was 2013, and it's still very, very similar. Um, uh, obviously, I teach grad, graduate students in education, so um, high-level reading is a critical component. There is audio and video content outside of our quote-unquote classroom time, and in the classroom time, we are doing those high-touch activities. Um, this model doesn't really support recorded lectures and online tests. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not what we do um, in, in our version of naked teaching or a flipped classroom. So here is what we, we did do and what I continue to do, though certainly I've expanded it over, over the course of the years. But um, so activities that involve critical thinking, writing and interacting, anytime I can have students um, giving a presentation, teaching a lesson, um, my students, when they leave, they are not just great teachers, but they also know how to teach online because they are forced to teach online um, throughout the program. Um, discussions. I have always been a fan of discussions. And in 2013, there was some pushback, like discussion boards aren't valuable. That was a conversation that was happening. Um, I'm really happy to see that the federal government embraces discussions as well. But discussions cannot be a free for all. That is not a best practice. Um, first and foremost, they need to be structured. Um, they need to be linked to the work that you're doing in the course. So they have to include analysis and synthesis of readings, theories, and concepts when you're at the graduate level. Um, we often do practical applications, case studies, and other um, ways to really uh, take the theories that we're reading about and put them into hypothetical practice. Um, and I am there and I have to be there. I structure the discussion. I structure the follow-up discussion. Now, my students are professionals in their fields already, generally, so I want them pushing their peers. Uh, I want them doing that, those nurturing challenges. You know, you said this, but maybe I was thinking this might be a better approach. Um, so I am not responding to every student, right? That's what their peers should be doing, but I am on the discussion board jumping in to give my practical experience to correct someone if the direction is going in the if the conversation starts going in the wrong direction. Um, so I am there, I am a presence there, I am leading the discussion while also allowing my graduate students the ability to grow as adult educators. Personal journals, you may have heard me give a presentation on personal journals in the past. I love this function. It doesn't exist in Brightspace. We're creating a workaround for it um, because it's so such an important part of what I do. Um, but structured reflection questions tie readings to, to life experience, professional practice, and it's a safe space for students. So when I teach diversity, family violence, other courses where there is sensitive topics, 
uh, and, and may be a cause for distress, or a student may have a question they're not sure is appropriate to ask, um, they can do that in the journal. Um, so it, it really keeps those larger group discussions running smoothly when students can check with me one-on-one -on -one in those journal spaces. Again, the journals are structured. It can't be a free-for-all. It, it has to be tied to course content or it doesn't count as um, sort of a learning activity. So here's what I said in 2013. I think I stand by it. New technological tools should be created based on instructional need, not just for the sake of creation. And again, this is something I witnessed in 2012, 2013. Maybe we're, we're giving you a new tool, but I didn't ask for it, right? I don't need it, or that's not how I teach. I really want there to be a better integration um, with faculty instructional design and, inst and instructional technology. Let's work together to, to build this thing. Um, I am really can't say enough about how the tools we pick should improve instructor student and student to student interaction, and we really want to avoid isolation. That's not to say I don't use gamification, because I do. There are fun things you can do um, that are sort of supplemental to the, to the um, instructor, instructor, and student, student interaction, or instructor, student, student, student interaction. But the isolation has to be, that alone time needs to be just a, a small part of it. It's a supplemental to the core. Um, funding needs to prioritize instruction. Maybe controversial, I stand by this position. And back in 2012, we were very concerned about political and corporate ties to educational technology. I would say less so now. Um, and it may be just that online ed was starting to massify and expand. And so we were, we wanted to be careful that no political actors were going to set the tone of education because higher education runs on academic freedom. It needs to continue to run on academic freedom because that's how we come up with so many wonderful ideas and innovations in our fields. Let's talk about RSI. So, you heard my presentation about what 2013 looked like. The federal government comes to look in my classes. I do a two hour deposition. I show them everything I do. Shortly after that matter of months, they create RSI. Um, it's a pretty good match for what I argued in 2013 and for what I do. I pulled this wonderful information and the next graphic off the SUNY Oscar RSI page, and the link is on the next slide. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful resource. So um, I really regularly uh, advise people to go look um, at that information as well. So that link is on the next page. Um, so RSI, regular and, substan and substantive interaction. What does this mean? It means our students can't be left alone, right? It, they have to be with us. We have to be with them. That instruction is still instructor to student. Um, so I, I think this, for me, was really, really uh, a validation of my work, but also helped me as well. And so I have a double star there by scheduled and predictable. Of course, I always scheduled all my assignments, discussions, journals, and office hours in advance. But one thing I didn't schedule was my video uh, interaction with students. So if I felt like doing a video message, if something came up in the class, I would put a video message out there. What I really um, realized is that it would be much better for students to make that more predictable and to schedule it right on the syllabus. Um, so for me, RSI really, it helped me to become a better instructor. I'm assuming most of you have seen this wonderful information about RSI, um, but it's really about making sure that the student has a relationship with their instructor. In a graduate course, that relationship is going to be very intense um, because we are creating masters and we're working in very small 
classes in general. In a large lecture size class, you're going to pick your RSI that is workable with the number of students that you have. Um, but my hope is that you do as much deep and meaningful connection with students as you can, uh, because that is the key to retention um, and to really being successful as an instructor. So here's, this is the graphic. We all love, I adore this graphic. Um, and it's really, really helpful just to kind of see how in some spaces, okay, like a weekly announcement, but no content, not really RSI. Um, you know, I love this and, and it matches what I do. And again, it has helped me to just constantly be thinking about what is meaningful, uh, what is substantive for those students. Hopefully you've all seen this before. The frowny face reminds me of Mr. Yuck, uh, <laughs> whoever used to put those stickers on our dangerous soaps that apparently we never locked up, but just assumed the child would see the sticker. Um, so I really love this. And again, go to that SUNY Oscar page. It is extremely helpful. Let's talk about naked RSI. So here is what I have found over the past um, 10 years to be the most useful for me. And since RSI uh, was released, I, I really have done a lot to make sure my work is more scheduled and more predictable. That's a place where I was failing, uh, I think, to uh, be as good as I could for or as uh, provide as as much as I could for our students. So here's what I do in my courses, scheduled weekly video messages, and they are personal. So if I'm teaching two sections, which I don't get to do anymore, but if I was teaching two sections of the same course, they would be two different messages. Why? Because I am going to say, hey, Susan made a great example in our discussion last week. And so, uh, and then maybe explain some content around individual examples, calling students out by name in a positive way, only in a positive way. Um, really makes a student feel connected to you and also to the class. And it just makes the class realize that this is not um, a canned YouTube or TikTok video. This is a person talking to me personally. Now, I cover both content and assignments, um, but I have that content piece in. Students like um, to know what's coming up in the course. So I do say due dates coming up, this is happening. And I also do something very important. It is a high impact practice to connect your assignments to past courses and future courses. Um, so in those weekly um, discussions, I'm gonna say now this paper we're writing is um, gonna be sort of the, the start of a paper you write in another class, 605, and your comprehensive exam is gonna build on it. So you wanna think about how you make those connections. That's a high impact practice. So just because the graphic says uh, weekly announcements without content don't count, you can do content and announcements. Um, and for me, that personalized piece is what is so important. Um, I do those in-depth structured weekly discussions and I am in there. Um, part of this is because I teach a lot of sensitive topics, so you have to be in there. Um, but it's just, it's a value for me. Uh, not only am I teaching the students because my students are graduate level and coming from professional fields, I learn a lot in there too. Um, so I love discussions, um, but again, they have to be structured and you have to be in there. Uh, for me, I keep my discussion period short, three days. These three days, this is how it works. This is when it, it's open to try to make us feel like we're all together at the same time. Um, we're not, someone's on at 5 a.m. and someone's on their lunch break, but it feels like we're together because those responses are coming in more quickly. A one and two week discussion, it is hard to make it feel like a strong, tight learning community. 
Um, personal journal entries, love, love, love. Every week you hear from me. Thanks for your journal entry, answering some questions, feedback on content. Um, ask the instructor discussion board. Now my first instructional designer who trained me an angel taught me about the ask the instructor discussion board. And I absolutely love this. I do promise a 24 hour response time, including weekends and holidays, uh, because my students work during the week. So they really need me when they are off of work. Um, but that to me is a great way just for them to know I'm there. You can get me, I'll get back to you right away. Um, weekly scheduled online office hours. During COVID, I moved from having them um, on my contact page in my course. So in Blackboard, in my sort of, here's the page about me, I had that office hours link kind of buried to now I put it right in the left-hand navigation bar, the increase in students coming to see me is uh, like 90%, right? It is a huge, huge increase in students because they see it and they remember, oh, office hours, I forgot I could do that. So I really front load the fact that I have three hours online every week for you. You can pop in at any time. Um, for us at SUNY Buffalo State, online office hours are required. They are a faculty requirement if you teach any online course. Um, so that RSI is, is a requirement of the campus. And of course, I haven't had a student come to see me face to face in, in a long time because my students live all over the country and all over the world. Um, I love video and audio feedback on assignments as well as written feedback. Um, but this I think is so important, especially at the graduate level. When we are doing high level writing, you have to be able to give students um, extensive feedback so that they understand how to do that academic work in the future. Um, so every week a student should be getting um, multiple touches from their instructor, discussion board, journal entry, uh, and the assignment feedback, plus the optional office hours. I'm there, they're welcome to come. And those other, uh, and the ask the instructor discussion board and the email, I have a 24 hour email response time as well. So let's think back to 2013. Um, naked teaching online is in line with best practices in adult education. I thought that then, I think it now. Um, online courses can be meaningful. They can be strong learning communities. The sort of image of a student working alone by themselves with no interaction with anyone, it didn't happen. That's not the direction we moved in. Um, touch is more important than tools tools should facilitate the touch. And I think, again, we're moving in that direction. Look at Brightspace. It is a very personal tool. There's so much video option. There is so much you can do there to increase touch. Um, and face-to-face -face and online faculty have to write the future for higher education together. I said that then. I still believe it. I have no idea what the next 10 years will look like. I don't think any of us do. We have to be in this together. And my additional thoughts, look at COVID, obviously an unexpected radical change point between when I wrote this in 2013 and when I am speaking to you now. Um, the rapid expansion of online learning and also just the embrace of all of the aspects of it, Zoom calls, um, uh, you know, um, all of the uh, students increased comfort with using the tools involved and desire for additional online learning because, hey, COVID isn't over and there are still many students who are seeking um, uh, more uh, safe spaces uh, from the many viruses that are currently going around. I love RSI. Look at when this came out, you know, everybody grumbles, it's a federal guideline and we have to do a million things. I love RSI because it is a regulation that is clearly student centered. Um, it's not a regulation for the sake of regulation. Having regular and substantive interaction with students is good for students. Um, and, and it really does mirror those principles of naked teaching. Again, maybe they pick something up when they were with me, who knows? Um, while privileging the role of faculty student interaction is valuable, I love that about RSI. I do think, and I think others have 
probably pointed out as well that not having anything about the peer-to-peer -peer interaction um, is problematic and that I think it should be included um, because we know student interaction, collaborative learning is a high impact practice. Um, and so I think and I fear that some instructors may focus so completely on instructor to student that they eliminate or minimize student to student. And so we wanna see that peer interaction perhaps added to RSI in some way in the future. Um, and look at RSI is a tool of retention period um, with the higher education constriction across the United States and certainly within SUNY. Um, we don't just need to improve recruitment. We are all working, I, I'm sure, in our individual campuses very hard on improving retention. All the research has shown that if there is a good, positive, meaningful instructor-student relationship, then we are going to improve retention. Um, and this is also a place where we can really help those students, underserved students that are coming in and that might be struggling for whatever reason, building that faculty um, student relationship is gonna be very, very key. Um, and I think actually there is there are so many great opportunities for SUNY. Um, for example, um, I have a lot of students in other parts of New York State. Well, I would love for them to be able to go to their partner SUNY campus in Cortland or um, downstate and be able to access the food pantry at a campus that isn't Buffalo State, but is their home campus. Um, so in the future, I really think we can even build um, a stronger SUNY um, sort of community for our online students that is both virtual and really face-to-face -face on a variety of different campuses. So those are my thoughts on Make It Teaching, the 2013 to now, where we are, and I can't wait to hear your questions if you have any. Anything in the chat? Oh, I see a great question about um, audio, video, and accessibility. This is huge. So when I started in 2012, really thinking through Naked Teaching 2013, I was doing a lot of podcasting. Um, but just-in-time podcasting on our campus did not require a transcript, and I couldn't I didn't have the time as a young faculty member to do the transcript. Um, so if I had no students requesting accessibility, I was using an audio without transcript um, video mess or messages. That was a mistake. Um, obviously, I do not do that anymore. Um, we have to use video that has captioning and or transcription embedded and ready to go. Uh, for me, I use YouTube videos with transcription and I provide a summary uh, of what I talked about in the piece. But I think this is where the tools could be improved. Any tool that can help me with accessibility, now that's a tool I love. And that that is a tool worth investing in um, because that is such a, a key uh, piece for making that content um, really meaningful to the student. Even if a student, um, they just might prefer to, to listen and see. They might, they might want both um, just because that is how they like to um, take in their content. Obviously, Blackboard Ally has been incredibly helpful to me um, in terms of uh, improving my courses and making sure Sure that I am constantly um, getting better in terms of accessibility. I think it's critical. Oh, good. I see Brightspace video notes. Do you have captions now? Good, <laughs> because I am very excited to use those notes when I start. I am starting in uh, Brightspace in J term. If anyone has any other questions or comments, please let me know. Um, again, I think that Oscar rubric um, and the site for the RSI is so wonderful and helpful. And I think the key for me is just trying to consider that all instructors 
are doing the same thing, just in different ways. And if we're doing the same thing, if we're building tight learning communities and tight relationships with students, we want to do that in an, in an online space as we would in a face-to-face -face space, only arguably maybe better um, because there are so many tools we can use in addition to building those communities. So, um, Andrea, I just wanted to kind of weigh in a little bit on your third bullet there. Um, um, it really has to do with the um, intent and focus of RSI. Yeah. And, and really, I want to make sure that people understand that RSI is a Department of Education federal regulation, and it is um, really intended to help the Department of Education distinguish between correspondence courses and, right. and distance learning education for the purposes of financial aid right. only, full right. stop. It is not at all saying anything about quality online instruction. It does not, it's not being used in that way. Um, it's not intended to be used in that way. It's really intended to help the DOE understand, is this a correspondence course, in which case no financial aid, or is it a distance learning course, in which case fine for financial aid. So, so I would I would rephrase um, you know uh, that bullet a little bit because um, because it's never ever going to include student to student interaction because that doesn't help them understand correspondence from non correspondence and um, and and. I also want to reinforce that it's not saying anything about quality. So we all know, all of us who teach online, and I would venture to say, I have never seen a correspondence course in SUNY. <laughs> there may be some, somewhere someone teaching in that manner, but I haven't seen it. Most of us teach in very, you know, social constructivist and interactive ways where there is ample faculty to student and student to student and student to content and, you know, all types of interaction happening, all the things that you described. Um, and so it's, you know, you, you could not do a course of high quality if you only followed the RSI regulation. Just yes, say. and I, I didn't want to give the impression that I didn't know it was financial aid. I certainly do. The financial aid auditors came to Buff State, mm -hmm. and I think when they went through my courses, they were, that was one of the things they were sort of nationally trying to figure out. What is the difference? Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think that... Um, that when you have a regulation, it because it shouldn't be a quality measure, of course, um, but it is sort of a minimum expectation. Um, and so I, I'm just putting it out there that, yeah. that um, in the future, they may want to think about um, sort of expanding their vision of um, what it what it means um, in the online space, but you're certainly right. And, and I do understand it's not the same as a quality measure. It is just for those. Yeah. And reasons. it's hard to, it's hard <laughs> to, um, it, to, to separate the two, right. Especially mm -hmm. for us, I think it, it's, it's difficult, but what I fear and what I, I want to make sure that people don't misunderstand is that if you only do RSI, that's not a high quality course. And in fact, that's not the purpose of this regulation to ensure quality. It's really only to help the DOE understand if, if your course or your, your institution or your courses are eligible for financial aid. And so, um, so while it's very important and there are things that you can do that do represent high quality, um, and of course, you know, we don't want to um, we don't want to encourage faculty to not be present in their courses, right? right. Because that is a significant right. aspect of quality. Um, uh, it, the whole RSI regulation just has this very narrow focus, and I don't want people to misunderstand or misinterpret it. Um, so anyway, 
I, your presentation <laughs> was awesome. Thank you. Um, well, thank you to everyone who came. Someone asked about the workaround for journals, uh, or for, yes, for journals. It's a discussion workaround that I am working with my instructional uh, designer team on now. So um, the discussions can be set up as journals is my answer to that question. Um, and anyone can email me if they have any thoughts or ever want to do a presentation or uh, research or write a paper on online teaching. I love uh, collaborative opportunities. So thanks, everyone. Any, we still have a few minutes. Any last questions um, or things that anyone wants to chat about while we still have, uh, you know, a, a group here? Oh, oh. Someone, someone asked about quantity of discussion posts. Um, I don't, I don't really have an answer for that in terms of um, what would count as RSI or number of journals um, or number of posts. I think for me, I have discussions weekly. Uh, it's regular. Um, students have to interact. And so it will depend on the discussion, how many posts I expect. Um, but I don't think our, I don't think RSI or the government would be that micro um, detailed in the exact sort of number, as long as you are having opportunities every week that are meaningful for interaction. Um, I think you're hitting that that federal guideline. Do you agree? They're pretty prescriptive um, about what counts and what doesn't count. Um, so um, what is important is to be aware and to uh, make sure that you're incorporating at least two of the types of interaction that they are um, um, saying count and that they are you know, initiated by the instructor, scheduled and predictable. Those are the main characteristics of, a, of, a, you know, of compliance. And there are things that don't count, right? TAs don't count. So if you have a large format course, interaction with the TA does not count. Videos don't count. Um, it, you know, so no matter how much time you put into personalizing or whatever, it, um, the, the, they don't count. So um, it, it, it is pretty prescriptive, not to the extent of numbers of, of responses and discussions, but the, it has right. to be scheduled and it has to be predictable and initiated by the instructor. So it can't be just ask me a question. There has to be a forum at, that initi is initiated by the instructor and that's on the schedule somehow so that students know how to access it and when to access it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it well, is a funny little regulation. Yes, definitely. Like number of student response posts, that's going to be instructor dictated, I think. But in terms of the uh, of RSI, instructor video discussions of content are a type of RSI. Correct? No, they don't count. No. So on the so if we go to the graphic um, on our slide here, weekly announcements explaining content yep. are are in the RSI category. Yeah. Yep. So the way that that would count is if you have a discussion that is um, uh, a companion to the video, right? Because right? it, it's just one way. A video is just one way. Right. So unless right. unless you have a video that has an associated discussion with it that is specifically connected, you'd have to say after the video, if you have any questions about this video, um, you know, we'll do that here in this discussion space on this day or during this time frame right. or, or whatever. So just a video by just by itself, it doesn't count. With even video feedback, even video feedback, like if you if you in your in your assignments or quizzes or tests, if you provide video feedback to students and it's personalized to that individual student, it doesn't count unless the student has a way to ask a question or get clarification right. on the, um, you know, and, and they can't initiate it. The, the instructor. Right. Well, that's to. right. Right, that's clear. And I think um, obviously the personal journals are a great example of where you can do that bi-directional 
um, interaction with students. Um, so I think that would be a great example. So those journals, Andrea, those journals, if they are initiated by the student, it wouldn't count. Yeah. Right. Nothing's initiated by the student. Not in, I mean, the, the, um, I think the structure of the course is initiated by the instructor, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but the interaction in terms of if you have a video with your discussion, those are companion together yeah. as part yep. of your weekly yep. package, right? So yep. here's the content discussion. We have a, a, a content video. Here's yeah. our discussion. Here's our journal. These are all the ways that we work yeah. together yeah. in implementing yep. that RSI. Yep. Yep, you just need to be, you know, aware of of what you're going to document as counting, right? So yeah, very cool. Um, so I think we're past our time. So I'm just gonna yes. say thank you to our speaker and for sharing her expertise Bye, today. and to all the participants for your attendance and your attention. The slides and recordings of all of the sessions are gonna be made available on the website. And um, I think um, I think Aaron posted that. Um, we encourage you to explore additional offerings for the US uh, DLA National Distance Learning Week lineup um, at the second link and um, there they're posted so thank you very much thank you Andrea's very good